I am taking January off, and while I'm gone, some amazing creators are going to be taking over this channel. We start with Rowan Francis, a cardiologist who runs Medlife Crisis. His video includes footage from his diving trip to Borneo, and a couple of jokes that I am deeply uncomfortable with. Rowan, over to you. How long can you hold your breath? One? Two minutes? I'm sorry, Homo sapiens is just pretty pathetic. Next to the diving world champions, who can stay underwater for one or two hours. So how do they do it? Well, there are a few different ways. Some you can actually take advantage of by channeling your inner dolphin. Others involve a little bit of gentle evolution, so maybe a bit of a tall order for most of us, unless you're a member of an Asian community who have evolved into real life Aquamen. There are five ways we can spend longer underwater. Number one is to increase your tolerance to carbon dioxide. The first thing that makes you want to take a breath is a rising level of carbon dioxide, or hypercapnia. Hyper from the Greek meaning too much or above, and kapnos meaning smoke. This acidic waste gas builds up, and the body is so acutely sensitive to any changes in pH, even though it's tiny, that it starts screaming at you to breathe, goddamn you! Incidentally, this is why any diet claiming to alkalinize your blood is basically... Mm. Now you can improve your carbon dioxide tolerance quite quickly. I was able to go from about 90 seconds breath hold to five minutes with just a few days worth of snorkeling and some tips from an experienced freediver. The next obstacle though is a lot harder to get around and that's hypoxia or low oxygen. Hypoxia kills cells. No matter how you die, ultimately it's hypoxia at the cellular level, i.e. your cells being starved of oxygen, that is the cause of your inevitable death. Unlike training your body to become more tolerant to hypercapnia, increasing your tolerance to hypoxia takes years of training, and of course there is a level past which no human can actually go. So what is the solution for a longer dive? Well, to maximize oxygen delivery and minimize oxygen use. Which brings me to number two. The reason that this steak is red is a protein called myoglobin, which is found in the muscles of pretty much every mammal, and it's responsible for storing oxygen. However, if we were tucking into a steak that came from a seal, it would be almost black in appearance because they've got 10 times more myoglobin than humans. Or, or, or cows. This is not a human steak. So why can't we just pack in more myoglobin and store more oxygen like the seals do? The problem with proteins is that... The problem with proteins is that That's when they get very close to the problem with proteins is the problem with proteins is when they get too tightly packed they start to clump together and lose their function. But marine mammals have evolved a very clever way to deal with this. Their variant of the myoglobin molecule uh, has a positive electric charge. As I'm sure you know, positive repels positive, and as a result, yeah. the proteins can get very close yeah. together without forming those clumps. Number three is to adjust your blood flow, to preferentially supply the heart and the brain at the expense of things like the extremities, which are much more tolerant to having a reduced blood flow. And number four is to slow your heart down. The heart is a very oxygen hungry organ, so by reducing your heart rate, you're immediately buying yourself more time underwater. I've mentioned these two together because they form part of the dive reflex erroneously sometimes called the mammalian dive reflex. It's actually been found in pretty much every air-breathing vertebrate that's been studied. It's stimulated by submersion in water, particularly cold water. And remember, below 200 meters depth, water is cold no matter where you are in the world, and of course that's where most mammals do their hunting. So what is the dive reflex? Well, let's take a look. Uh, that that's the wrong video. I've not tried this before, but I filled up a basin with ice water and I'm going to hold my breath and submerge my face in the water, probably just for about 30 seconds or so, and I'll see if anything happens to my heart rate. I've got a uh, pulse oximeter uh, that you can see. Okay, here it goes. That was cold. So my heart rate has uh, dropped right down to 45. Uh, it's still staying at 45. I don't know how long I was under. 
maybe uh, 30, 40 seconds. And now you can see it's slowly starting to climb again. This is just a cheap 10 pound oximeter that I bought online. So I don't know how low the heart rate goes. I don't know when it starts becoming inaccurate, but a lot of these commercial devices will have a cutoff in the 40s because most people's heart rate doesn't go that low. Um, but I think it was a pretty clear demonstration. In diving mammals, this is far more pronounced with Waddell seals, for example, dropping the heart rate as low as four beats a minute. This effect is mediated by my favorite nerve, the vagus. Don't tell me you don't have a favorite nerve. Number five is also part of the dive reflex because it has another feature, and that's to squeeze your spleen. The spleen is normally a small organ which is involved with the immune system and filtering the blood, and as such, stores a little reservoir of blood. Now, in a healthy human with a normal sized spleen, that volume will be around 160 milliliters of blood, or 5% extra oxygen carrying ability, which can be squeezed out as part of the dive reflex when needed. However, Diving mammals can have significantly enlarged spleens, representing a much bigger reservoir of blood to be provided when necessary. I'm sorry, it looks like this one's out of reach for most of us. But that doesn't mean that there aren't any members of our species that haven't taken advantage. However, to meet them, we're going to need to take a short trip to Southeast Asia. Years ago, I um, saw a BBC documentary that stuck in my mind permanently, which uh, was about a fisherman who um, was so negatively buoyant, he essentially sank 20 meters um, and walked along the bottom of the seabed. And what's more, he almost effortlessly held his breath for several minutes. He was a member of the Bajau community, who are an ethnic group indigenous to uh, oceanic uh, Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Indonesia, and uh, here, uh, I'm in North Borneo at the moment, in Sabah, uh, where they're one of the biggest ethnic groups. And my diving instructors here uh, tell legendary stories of Bajau who can hold their breath for 15 minutes at a time underwater. So what makes them so special? The Bajau have led a nomadic subsistence lifestyle for at least a thousand years, literally living out at sea, eating what they catch, and rarely setting foot on land. Earlier this year, a research team led out of Copenhagen published an incredible study which demonstrated that the Bajau have evolved larger than average spleens when compared to nearby non-diving communities. Freedivers develop big spleens through training, but the enlarged spleens of the Bajau are seen in members of the community who don't do any fishing or diving, so we know that this is a genetic adaptation. You might wonder how a genetic pressure has been exerted until you consider the fact that the Bajau who dive spend five hours underwater per day. So you can easily imagine how any mutation to confer an increased diving ability would have been positively selected. They identified many genetic variations seen in the Bajau, but two snappily titled genes stood out. PDE10A is a gene noted to have differences amongst the Bajau, specifically the part of the gene that is responsible for thyroid function and spleen size. And the BDKRB2 gene is involved in the blood redistribution part of the dive reflex that we talked about earlier. Rather like the Sherpa in the high altitude Himalaya, this is evidence of human evolution from our fairly recent past. And now we're in the era of genetic analysis becoming commonplace, we're able to trace specific mutations and how they've traveled through time and geographically to make us the people we are today. But does research like this actually benefit patients here in hospital? Well, I see the effects of hypoxia secondary to disease on a daily basis where it causes death and disability. The hope is that by understanding how the Bajau or the Sherpa have adapted to life in a low oxygen environment might guide development of new treatments to help they're critically ill. Honey, I've, uh, I've thought of a name. Uh, just, just hear me out here. What do you think of Tom Scott Francis? Oi! Ah, thanks, Rowan. Go subscribe to Medlife Crisis. I would recommend starting with his Minute Medicine video on why you shouldn't run every medical test, even if you can. Next week, a maths puzzle for you.